Good morning, TBC. Good morning. We're still waking up a little bit today. Let's, let's try that again. Good morning, TBC. Good morning. Oh, there we go. That was fast. You woke up. You're ready to go. I am too. So excited to be here with you. For those of you who are new, my name is Stephen Knight. I'm the lead pastor here at Turning Point Church. So excited that you're here checking us out, worshiping with us this morning. And for all of us, it is so good to worship together. So thank you. As we come here, we're continuing our series called Radical Relationships, focusing on unique aspects of relationships within Christianity. They're unique. They're unlike anything else. And today, we're going to talk about the life of a disciple maker how this is unique, the, the relationships we have, disciple maker relationships. But let me ask you this question as we get started. How many of you, I'm curious in the room, how many of you have ever traveled to Europe before? Just raise your hand if you've ever traveled to Europe. Okay, we, we got a few. All right, we have a few upstairs too. Okay, we got a few. Here's the thing. People, when they travel to Europe, they usually fly to Europe, right? Like, this is pretty normal. Like, it's been a while since I ran into someone that's like, you know, I paddle boarded. It's a good arm workout, you know? Like, it, you just don't do that. You fly, right? But even when people fly, sometimes they, they get on the plane, they go across, and they're like, oh, man, that was exhausting. Like, well, what'd you do? Oh, man, I, I watched two movies. That was, that was brutal. It was brutal. Like, what was it, though? Because the thing about it, we used to travel by boat across the Atlantic Ocean, all right? This would take like six weeks if you even survived, right? Like airplane travel is so much easier. But even whether we're traveling by plane or by boat or even by car, I don't know if you've ever gone on a car trip. How many of you have done that? You've driven on some sort of car trip, vacation trip, lots of people, right? You get exhausted even from that. And what are you doing? You're sitting there and you're driving and yet we're exhausted. You're like, I need a day to recover. I need a day. I need a day, right? As we go through life, there are periods of our lives that we get tired or we get exhausted. Sometimes we understand why, sometimes we don't. But often when we go through those times, our needs begin to surface a little bit more. We get to be reminded about what we truly need. And this morning, as we talk about disciple-maker relationships, we're going to talk about how these disciple-maker relationships are something we need. And maybe as I talk about them, as we look at Scripture this morning, you may be like, you know, I don't know if I have all of those. Or maybe you haven't had any of these before. But I want you to know these are so critically important to our spiritual growth and to our faithfulness in living out the mission that God has given to us to make disciples. Now, not only is this good for us to do, but we benefit from it as well. And it can actually change your life. So we're gonna be talking about that this morning as well. Now, this term disciple maker, maybe you've never heard it before. Um, I created a definition for it. A disciple maker is someone who makes disciples. Some of you are like, Pastor Stephen needs to work harder at his definitions. <laughs> maybe. But it's really simple, right? A disciple maker, someone who makes disciples. We look at Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission. I'd love to read this together as we get started. It says this, Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18. It says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go, make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Friends, when we look at this, the great commission that we have been given, we think about sharing the gospel. And then as people start following Jesus, we baptize them. And then we, we teach them, we disciple them. These are all critical parts of our lives and what we're to do as Christians. Now, we talked recently about sharing the gospel. So I'm going to shift our attention to one specific part of, of the Great Commission is that of making disciples, discipling others. And as we do that, I want to challenge think about who is in your disciple-making circle, okay? I want you to think of it like a circle and you're in the middle. Who is in your disciple-maker circle, because Christians who make a radical impact with their lives, they need a Paul, 
They need a Barnabas. And they need a Timothy in their lives. Let's look at scripture together this morning. First, let's look at that relationship, that Paul relationship, because I think everyone needs a Paul in their life, someone that's pouring into them, helping them grow spiritually. It's fascinating. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says this, you have heard me teach things. This is Paul speaking. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. It's a short verse, but a powerful verse. It talks about these truths, wisdom that must be passed on, the truths of Scripture. But it's more than just teaching someone else. There's multiplication involved. Let's look at this again, because it's Paul speaking, but that's the first layer. He's, he's speaking, he's teaching, he's discipling Timothy. That's the second layer of disciple making. The third is trustworthy people. Timothy is to pass those things on to trustworthy people. And the fourth is others. So you see Paul, Timothy, trustworthy people, others, four layers of disciple making. It's incredible to think about. We've we've been tasked with this amazing work that we can do. But as Christians, we have to think about it, not just as, oh, let's, let's teach things occasionally. Let's learn things occasionally. But there's this intentional method of disciple making that results in multiplication. And over time, these relationships can become quite close. These disciple-making relationships. Um, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 1, 2, he says, I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord, give you grace, mercy, and peace. Think about that. Paul's not related to him. He's writing to Timothy. He calls him my dear son son. By this point, they've, they've grown so close to relationship. He looks at Timothy as like a son to him because he's poured into Timothy in that way. Now, someone asked me once, how do you believe that God exists if you haven't seen him? What I wanted to reply with is, well, I believe that Home Depot employees exist, even though I've never seen them. (laughs) Right? You're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Here's the thing. I've gone to Home Depot, and I have met a few Home Depot employees before. No worries. There's a few in there. And I've met them. And I found it really helpful when I talk to someone in their department, and they know what they're talking about. And I can learn from them. I can ask questions about what parts I might need or, or how about to go whatever project I'm working on at home. But what's interesting, I'm not a, an expert handyman by any means, but I've done enough things renovating house projects before uh, that um, I've gone to Home Depot before and I've talked to employees and, and they don't know what they're talking about. And it's awkward when I'm teaching them about their own area, right? It makes me appreciate even more when I go in and I talk to someone who knows what they're doing, they've got wisdom to pass on to me. They may not know everything, but they are helpful. They are looking to invest in me, help me to learn and to grow in, in, in terms of what I need to do. And friends, in the same way, we all need someone to help us grow spiritually. Someone that is investing in us, that can answer those questions, that help us grow. We need that Paul figure in our lives, whoever that might be. So as you're thinking about this, my guess, some of you here do have a Paul figure in your life. But most people I talk to don't have this figure in their lives. I want to encourage you to find that person. And you may be asking, like, how do I find it? I mean, it is super easy to say, hey, you know, think of someone you look up to, you respect, you think, oh, you know, I think they've got some spiritual maturity. I think I can learn from them. Say, hey, can we grab lunch? Can we grab coffee or whatever it is? Go play mini golf, whatever your thing is, right? Like, ask them, like, hey, let's go connect. Um, I was joking about mini golf. That would be awkward. Don't do that. Um, but if whatever that activity might be, ask them, hey, let's go connect. Ask if, you say, hey, I'd love to hear your story. Maybe ask him a few questions. Say, I've been thinking about this. Ask him a spiritual question. You can kind of feel out and see, are are they someone that could invest in me? And if you click, and if the answer is yes, then hey, great. Maybe you can continue to meet with them and say, hey, I'd love to do this again. Or if you don't click, well, don't keep meeting with them because that's awkward, right? (laughs) 
But find that Paul, take that time, get to know someone. And if you're like, hey, I don't really know who to ask. I don't, you know, I, I know a few people, but I'm not really sure who could be that figure. Man, I would encourage you, one of the easiest ways to do that, join a small group, get to know others in the small group. Maybe there's someone in the small group that you're like, hey, that's someone that I could connect with. That's someone that I can ask questions and, and uh, connect with on a more regular basis. That would be a great way to f- feel out who might be a good Paul for you, to invest in you, to disciple you. So everyone, I think, needs a Paul in their life, someone that's pouring into them, helping them grow spiritually, but also everyone needs a Barnabas in their life. And it's, it's fascinating as we look at Scripture. We're going to read two excerpts from the uh, book of Acts. Acts 9 and Acts 11. We're going to see the beginning of this relationship with Paul and Barnabas. Now, for those of you, um, if you haven't spent time in Acts before, what happens, there's this guy named Saul. He meets Jesus, starts following Jesus, and eventually his name goes from Saul to Paul. So when I say Paul and the text says, says Saul, it's referring to the same person. So I just want to clarify that as we walk through the text here. But let's go to Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 26. It says, when, Paul, oh, excuse me, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Fast forward to chapter 11. It says, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And it was in Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. You see, Paul and Barnabas, they're in Antioch. They do this ministry together. They are shoulder to shoulder with each other. It's interesting for all of us. God's design for us is not to do ministry alone but to do it with others. Think about 1 Corinthians 12. um, He uses the analogy of of the human body. You've got different parts of the human body, the ear, the eye, et cetera, uh, but it's all part of one body. In the same way, each of us, we are all part of one local church body here at Turning Point Church, and we use our gifts and our strengths together. And although we're different from other people around us, we all work together. We, We shoulder up together to do the work of ministry. And as we do that, what does it look like to have that Barnabas figure in our lives? So that means we're serving with others and we're encouraging each other as we do it. That we're walking alongside each other in this discipleship journey. And hopefully we're encouraging each other to live out our faith. Proverbs 27, 17 is iron sharpens iron so a friend sharpens a friend. How can we sharpen each other? as we serve God. You know, it's interesting. My guess is many of us here this morning have smartphones. Um, if you got a smartphone, pull it out for me real quick. Let's see how many we got. Okay, my guess, um, I was, I'm going to say most. I, I never want to say all because there's always someone that's like, I've got a dumb phone and I'm proud of it. Okay, well, fine. All good. If you, if you like your dumb phone, that's fantastic. Good for you. If you get lost, that thing ain't helping you on the GPS side of things, Right. So I've got a smartphone. You can see it up here. What's interesting about the smartphone, okay, is that it can do so many things. It's an incredible device. In fact, this smartphone that you hold in your hand, that I hold in my hand, is more advanced than the computers that NASA used to send the first man to the moon. I know there's a few of you in the room that are like, I don't know if we actually went to the moon. I'm like, okay, fine. Like, we're not, we're not having that conversation today, all right? Hot Topic series is over. We're not covering that next year, sorry, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep going with the message today. We've got these credible advanced pieces of technology, the smartphone, that we can do thousands of things on. In fact, billions of people in our world today have smartphones. And you know what happens is we have it out all the time. It's a regular part of our lives. Think about that. When you wake up, how many times do you reach over, you grab your smartphone, and you look at it? You check email or check, check weather or social media, but then we do it all the time. You see this. You go out and people will just randomly, they'll take photos, they'll take videos, things like that. In fact, you guys look so good this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a photo of you guys. Is that okay? Yes. yes. Oh, good. One person said yes. So that means I can do it for everyone. All right. Three, two, one. Everyone smile and wave. 
If you're upstairs, you gotta wave, otherwise it looks like you're in prison behind those bars. Okay? Good. Here's the thing, what I just did, that is normal today. You see people, they're out in random places, photos, videos like this, and we don't even think about it anymore, right? Because this is such a normal part of our lives. In fact, when people are waiting in line, Many times they're not even talking to each other. They're on their phones. They're looking at it and they're surrounded by people. Even families at the dinner table, sometimes they'll be sitting there and looking at their phones, right? And not talking to each other. And it fills up the blank spaces of our week. Sometimes people sit in the bathrooms, they're on their phones even. And I don't have an image for that, so don't worry. Um, But if we're honest, pretty much everyone here has done that, right? You pull out your phone in the the bathroom. Like, we use them all the time. In fact, a Boston newspaper reported the story. uh, There were a bunch of people on a train, and they were all on their phones. Someone walked in and pulled out a gun, and no one noticed. Literally, no one noticed. And he didn't say anything. I'm sure it threw him for a loop. Okay, no one's looking at the gun. So he put it away. A couple minutes later, he's, I'm going to try this again. He pulls it out. No one even noticed. Put it away. Tried it a third time. No one noticed. The guy just walked off. Like, what? Like, what is happening? People did not even notice that their lives were potentially in danger because they're looking at our phones. We look at our phones all the time. And don't hear me wrong, church, because there are a lot of good things that happen because of smartphones. And there's some cool ministry things that have happened as a result of our smartphones. For example, some of you this very morning are looking at the Bible on your smartphone. You're following along with the message outline on version on your smartphone. There's lots of cool things that happen on our smartphones. They're great ways to connect with each other. But what's fascinating, if you look at the report on your smartphone, you can see how much time you've spent on your phone in average this week. And it's not recorded in minutes and it's recorded in hours for the majority of people in this room. Why do I raise that point this morning? It's because many of us, we spend so much time on our smartphones, and this is a recent invention. What we're seeing is that people are starting to spend a lot more time on their smartphones and a lot less time with other people. And one of the disadvantages of that is if we're not careful, we don't spend time with Barnabas. We don't spend time with those types of people that we need in our lives. And you can connect with them. You can get involved in a small group, spend time with them there. You can serve on a ministry team. You can serve, make an impact through one of our outreach initiatives. You can get engaged in all these ways and serve with Barnabas uh, uh, in your lives. I don't think we have a Barnabas by name in the room, but you know what I mean. Like someone um, that is a Christian that's, that's serving, you can encourage them, they can encourage you. It's so important for all of us to find that person. Find those people and to do life with them, to encourage them as you're serving Jesus together. So we've covered Paul, we've covered Barnabas. The third is Timothy. I think everyone also needs a Timothy in their lives as well. We see this in scripture. Great commission, go and make disciples. Second Timothy chapter three, Paul says this. He's speaking to Timothy. He says, you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you. You know that from infancy, you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We see in the life of Timothy, you've got Paul who's investing in him, who's discipling him. And and we see elsewhere in scripture, we see that when we think about Timothy being discipled from infancy, who's that? His mother and his grandmother had significant spiritual influence in his life invested in his life, discipled him in significant ways. It's so important. And Timothy, um, he eventually goes on to become a church leader. And he pours into others too, makes disciples as well. So as we think about this this morning, my question for you, are you making disciples? Who is your Timothy? And if you're, if you're here and you're like, I've, I've got some people I'm investing in, great, praise God. I know we've got a lot of those people in this very room. 
But if you're like, hey, I don't have someone I'm investing in, man, it, it's, it's not that hard to take that first step. You know, we talked about earlier going to lunch or coffee or something like that. You can do the same exact thing with someone that you want to disciple. See if you guys click. Or maybe it's leading a small group and investing in a small group. Or maybe it's, um, you're like, ah, I don't know, I, do you have another idea? Well, man, serving with kids or with students, making an impact in their lives, helping them grow spiritually too. I know we've got a great team doing that right now. We've got our kids ministry leaders in some of the classrooms right now. We've got a, a, a student ministry group meeting and there's some good ministry going on right now as we are in this very room. And it's so important. In fact, it's so important. Um, I'm going to ask this. I didn't tell them in advance. I may get in trouble for doing this. But I'm going to ask, if you're in the room and you are either a small group leader or this past year you've served as a kids ministry leader, would you stand up for a second? Would you stand up? Small group leaders, kids ministry leaders. Go ahead and stand up for a second, okay? So stay standing for a sec. All right, we're clapping for you. We are grateful for you guys. Um, Let me take a moment. Let's pause, and I want to pray together while you guys are standing. Lord, I thank you for our leaders in this room, leading small groups, leading in kids. I thank you for our kids ministry leaders, student ministry leaders right now doing that work in ministry. I thank you for how they're discipling others at TPC. I ask that you continue to bless their ministry and be at work through them. In Jesus' name, amen. I saw a few of their faces. I will get in trouble for that later, so we'll see how that goes. Um, Here's the thing. If you're nervous about making disciples, I want you to know it's okay. I've never met someone that said, man, that was easy. My first time, I knocked it out of the park. I was a professional. I did a great, like, no. Like, this is something we all take that first step in and we learn and we grow and we help someone grow as we're growing. We never reach that point where, okay, we're kind of a perfect Christian. It's time to start discipling, right? Like, God chose to work through you and through me. Not because we're perfect, because he wants us to be faithful and to be at work through us. And maybe you're looking for somewhere to start. Man, kids ministry, great place to start. They set you up, they train you. They've got uh, instructions like here's how you can teach the Bible lesson this week. Here's small group questions you can ask to pour into them. Uh, We've got several openings for assistant leaders right now and that's to go in and, and help those that are already engaged in that work. It's a great opportunity. If you're interested in that, grab that orange card in front of you, the next steps card, right kids ministry. Love to get you plugged in there. But maybe you're in the room and you're like, you know, I don't really like kids. Well, then start discipling adults, <laughs> okay? Please, don't work with the kids then. Start discipling adults. And if you're in the room and you're like, well, I don't really like people, <laughs> well, too bad. <laughs> you got to make disciples. This is not the great suggestion of Matthew 28. This is the great commission. We have been tasked with the incredible privilege and honor to go and share the gospel and make disciples. And we have this incredible opportunity to pour out from our lives, our imperfect lives, to pour into someone else, to help them grow spiritually, and then to teach them to do the same. It's incredible to see God at work. And when we're faithful to do it, Man, God can do some incredible things through you and through me. And my hope and my prayer is that we will be faithful to find the Timothy, to find the Timothys that we can pour into and make a difference in their lives. So church, who's in your disciple maker circle? Think about that circle. You've got your Paul You've got your Barnabas, you've got your Timothy. Who's in that circle right now? Or who needs to be in that circle? It was interesting as a teenager, the primary sport I played was basketball. And I was not very good. Some of you are like, you didn't have to tell us that. We could have guessed that, (laughs) right? Like, it's okay, it's okay. I'm not that tall. In sixth grade, I was five foot ten, and today I'm still six, five foot ten, right? Like I'm still that same height. In fact, I may have shrunk a little bit with age. I don't know. But here's the thing: I wanted so bad to be good at basketball. I would practice two to three hours a day. I was shooting shots, learning plays, working out, eating junk food. I didn't say I was totally committed, but mostly committed, right? Like I was trying to get better, and I was always just good enough to make the team. But I spent most of the time on the bench. I'd go in and play for a minute, two minutes, three minutes, not very much. 
but I kept working harder. It's like, I really want to do it. In fact, my junior, seniors of high school, we made it to the national championships in the, in the group we were part of, and, and I still sat on the bench, and I wanted so bad to get out there, to make a difference, to make an impact. Friends, when it comes to being a disciple maker, there is no bench. God wants us to do this work. It's a huge honor and blessing to be engaged in that. But I don't know about you, it's an encouragement to me to think, oh, I don't have to like sit on the bench and hope I'm good enough one day. No, God's like, I want to work through you right where you're at. Let's get in the game. Let's make a difference. Even if it takes time. Like friends, I want to encourage you. You think about Paul, Barnabas, Timothy. Man, I've had different Paul figures in my life. That's a big part of the reason I am who I am today. And I'm super grateful for that. Most of the time, I had to seek out those figures in my life. Sometimes it would take a month or two. I even at one point where it took me over a year to find a Paul because I would connect with a few people and we didn't click. And then I'd, okay, I'm gonna look for someone else who could be a fit that has the time, is ready to do this. I continue to seek it. I wanna encourage you with that because this is not something that we're looking at this morning that we can get fixed by next week right? Like this is something that takes time and takes effort. But I want to encourage you, it's worth it. It's worth it to be faithful to the Great Commission, to be engaged in this work of disciple making. So church, are you ready to be a disciple maker? Because Christians who make a radical impact in their lives need a Paul, a Barnabas, and Timothy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning, the ability to gather together, to worship, to spend time in your word. Discipleship, disciple making, it's it's so important. But at times, man, if I'm honest, God, I feel this in, in my life over the years. I know many of us do too. It's, it's something life gets busy and sometimes we just miss it. We miss the opportunities. We miss the, 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 the chance to invest in those relationships. And God, I confess, it's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to focus on just a career or other things that, um, God, I pray that you would Help us to grow not just in our attention, but our affections for others and making disciples. That we would be thinking about that, that we'd be driven to do that, God. That we would feel the impact of making disciples. That it'd be something we'd be faithful to do. Even if we don't feel like we're ready for it, God, you've called us to this task. And I encourage you, your 12 disciples, they were a ragtag bunch. Oh boy. You can work through them. You can work through us. I know it, God. And I I ask you that this morning that you would lead each of us to be engaged in this work of making disciples, to be faithful to what you've called us to do. God, thank you for your love. Thank you that you love us. Regardless of, of what we do in our lives, I hope that we're reminded about that this morning. God, you love us. Regardless of what happened this week, that you love us. Regardless of, of how long it, it takes us to take these steps forward, you want us to grow and you, and you love us in spite of all the things that we're struggling with, God. And I ask that for anyone this morning that maybe they feel a weight that's preventing them from living this out. They feel a weight from making disciples. They feel guilty or they feel busy. They feel exhausted, whatever that might be. God, I ask that you would do that work in their lives and our lives to bring us to this place to realize that that you love us and that's what matters and your desire is to have this close relationship with us and that it's from an overflow of that relationship with you, that time with you, that we would go out and we would make a difference in this world, that we make disciples. So God, I pray for those here that they need that time with you and that'll lead to this making of disciples. God, I ask that you'd help them to find that this morning. They would feel your love at a whole nother level this morning. God, I ask that you would guide us in that. As we grow closer to you, we make more of an impact for you as well. In Jesus' name.